Okay, all right. <laughs> GM, governance nerds, thank you. I know it's early. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm super excited because today I'm going to share the collective DAO archives with you all. Um, I work at the Optimism Foundation, which is stewarding the development of the Optimism Collective's governance system. So in my role, I do a lot of governance research. And I realized that there were two key resources that I was missing. The first were governance timelines, which most are or roadmaps, which most DAOs don't publish. And the second was a library where I could search policies, programs, and procedures across DAOs. So in order to do my job at the Optimism Foundation, I created these resources. And because supporting open source public goods is a core value of the Optimism Collective, today we're open sourcing these resources as the Collective DAO archives so that anybody can use them as a public good to advance the development of DAOs across the Ethereum ecosystem. So in creating these resources, I read thousands of forum posts so that you don't have to. <laughs> these resources are organized into 10 categories. I'm going to walk you through my takeaways for each. So the first category is voting. How does the DAO decide things? And the takeaway is that we need to match the decision-making model to the decision type. Most early DAOs started um, with systems that looked like direct democracy. So all token holders vote on all things. That can be very decentralized. It can also be inefficient. And for certain types of decisions, it's suboptimal. So then we saw DAOs um, transition to a more representative democracy model, um, usually via elected council. So 70% of the DAOs I analyzed had implemented some form of delegated decision making. This streamlines operations, but it also does increase concentration. So you don't want all your decisions to be delegated, and you don't want everybody voting on everything, right? Different, decision, um, di different decisions require different levels of decentralization. Sometimes you need maximum decentralization, and sometimes you can actually tolerate less. What you want to do is match the decision type to the decision-making model, and some helpful frameworks for thinking about that are Vitalik's convex versus concave decision making. And what we think a lot about at Optimism is plutocratic versus non-plutocratic. So now that we know how the DAO is making decisions, what does the DAO do? <laughs> and anybody who's worked in DAOs knows this is a really hard question to answer collectively because everybody has a different answer to this question. The takeaway is to create prioritization frameworks. So strategy is hard to define collectively, but if we don't define it, uh, basically the DAO <laughs> tends to be directionless as attention and spend is increasingly divided and short-term decisions are gonna dominate. So focused DAOs usually set strategy via prominent leadership or a core team that has a high degree of influence. The problem is as the DAO decentralizes and this leadership phases itself out, we run into the succession problem. So you can use prioritization frameworks as a tool to teach the community how to make these strategic decisions themselves. And these can be really high level like values, guiding principles, or scope, or they can be more granular like OKRs and KPIs. Uh, this sounds kind of basic, but only 55% of the DAOs I analyzed had a formal mission statement, vision, values, or public roadmap. Only 40% had published anything that looked like a KPI. Um, but these frameworks are really important because they empower the community to make these decisions themselves, which is going to increase the resilience of the DAO over time. So now that we know what the DAO is doing, how are we funding it? And this is a great quote from Left Terrace, who, among many other things, is a delegate for the Optimism Collective. And he's basically saying that if funding isn't tied to strategy, you're going to have a bunch of different initiatives that are going to drain your treasury. So the takeaway for this is that funding structure should be flexible. And most DAOs are not set up this way. Most DAOs 
organized by creating working groups. And these working groups usually look like business units that are funded indefinitely, that have full-time employees and are organized by domain. They usually have individual budgets that consolidate into an overall DAO budget that's unsustainable and can be three times higher than a startup at a comparable stage. Worse, they tend to overfund non-strategic initiatives and underfund core initiatives. So we're starting to see very few DAOs test this hypothesis that maybe funding would be more effective if it were tied to the DAO's goals instead of uh, being allocated to these domain-specific working groups. Uh, and ENS is leading the way on this front with um, the experiment they're running around their RFP program. So we'd love to see more DAOs experiment with flexible funding structures. Now that we know what we're funding, how do we make sure that uh, we do it? <laughs> and this is accountability is a big problem at most DAOs. And that kind of makes sense because DAOs are built on proposals, which are basically promises to do things. This problem was so acute that Aragon has a really fascinating forum post where they had to designate themselves the executor of last resort because so many proposals were passing that did not specify which party was going to execute what was in the proposal. Uh, so unsurprisingly, DAOs express concerns that competitors are out competing them on execution. So it's pretty, we know how to incentivize execution. We need to enable competition, experimentation, and speed. So how can we do that in the context of a DAO? Cabin DAO has experimented with something called duocracy. That's basically any initiative below a certain threshold automatically gets funded. You just go and do. Uh, Yearn Governance 2.0 introduced the concept of constrained delegation. That's basically you meet a set of criteria. You're equipped with a multi-sig budget. You don't need any votes on what you do with that budget. And more recently, we're starting to see frameworks like MakerDAO's Endgame and Atom 2.0, which propose a separation of powers between the, the parties that make decisions about strategy, budget, and execution. And the hypothesis is you can have a more neutral allocation of budget that incentivizes more competition among the parties executing. So this is basically what the DAO is doing. Uh, you know, what is the structure this is happening in? And this is one of my favorite categories. Uh, Rune Christensen from MakerDAO has a great quote, and he says, the really big problem with the complexity of MakerDAO is that it's not explicit. It's not written down. You don't even really know it's there until you see it in action. And that's a problem because power dynamics exist within all DAOs, but we're like, we're uncomfortable with it, so we resist defining it. The problem with that is undefined power is unchecked power. Power vacuums or the perception of them result in factions and then we get DAO drama and nobody wants that. Um, defining power is gonna be harder at DAOs that push governance to the social layer. And that's because there's two types of power. Hard power, that one's easy to see. That's positional authority and token ownership. And soft power, which is harder to see and harder to define. And that's influence and decision-making ability, which may not be explicit. 30% uh, of the DAOs analyzed had published something resembling an org chart, usually after about a year. Only 55% had published a code of conduct, so it's, it's going to be hard um, to have any kind of checks on power without one of those. So the, the takeaway is DAOs can't entirely avoid bodies of power. What's important is that they don't have more power than they need to accomplish their goals, and that the power be defined so you can put checks and balances around it. All right, so who's doing all the work? <laughs> Contributors. Um, it's hard to be a DAO contributor. Uh, and part of why is because many contributors have been faced with publicly defending their roles and salaries up to every three months. That's, that's brutal. Like, nobody wants to sign up for that. Um, in a completely transparent, direct to DAO hiring model, the main mechanism for accountability is public firing by token holders. There's not really an opportunity for softer accountability mechanisms like performance reviews or improvement plans. Basically, most DAOs still need to incorporate pretty basic HR practices. 
In the DAOs I analyzed, only 20% had codified hiring practices, 40% had formalized compensation policies. So it's not really surprising that contributor burnout is super prevalent and um, retention issues surfaced after only seven months. I think we can alleviate part of this problem if we make a distinction between contributors and representatives. So DAO representatives directly manage the DAO's resources or make decisions on behalf of token holders. They should be elected and they should be held accountable publicly. Contributors do work for the DAO. They make t-shirts, they host hackathons, they you know, do a bunch of things, but they don't need to be elected and they don't need to be held to the same level of public scrutiny as a representative. The path to decentralization is something any DAO that's progressively decentralizing struggles with because it's hard to find the balance between the core and the community. On the community side, this transition looks like a struggle for gradually more autonomy. On the core side, you're trying to transition your operations over to the community, and the main challenge is this mindset shift that has to occur when you go from being an employee to a contributor, because you're moving from a position of authority to a position of service, and it's not intuitive, and it's hard. The balance between these two parties, the tension that arises is not usually around the existence of control. It's usually because there's ambiguity around it. So the best way to prepare the community for this transition is to provide transparency around where the control exists and what the path is to transfer it to the community. And some DAOs involve the community in defining this path. The, the part that we don't talk about as much is how to prepare the core team for this transition. Um, and my recommendation on that is to start hosting educational workshops well before this transition has to happen so that employees can start to understand what it means to be a contributor. What is the DAO's operating system? How is the, what are the rules that are governing this whole thing? This is policy and it's really important. Uh, this is a great quote from Jing, who's a director of the Optimism Foundation. And she says, systems need to be both capable of change and capture resistance, which is a much harder problem to solve than a static capture resistance system. DAOs tend to define policy reactively, and that's okay. DAOs are emergent. We don't really know what's going to happen before it happens. The problem is when we do so, we overcorrect and overspecify. I'm not advocating for structurelessness. We know that that results in collapse. And when you don't define important parameters, what happens is you create this sort of common law system where norms are developed by precedent. You create this path dependency of the DAO, and it's really hard to change. So what we need to do is implement something in the middle, which is a minimized governance system that's as flexible as the DAO is itself. So when you're designing process and policy, you need to make sure you ask yourself, what is the process to change this process? Rather than prescriptive rules, which are going to break in the face of a million edge cases that are going to arise every day, we should be thinking about frameworks that teach the community how to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. And in my analysis, the healthiest DAOs actually had minimal policy. You can see this in the, in the timelines. Uh, and instead, they were redesigned to prevent exploitation of the system in the first place. What are the tools everybody's using to do all, this, all these things? Um, and I like this quote because it basically says organizations are communication structures. So it's not surprising that the majority of initiatives I identified in the tooling category were focused on communication. So DAOs are pretty good at um, top-down communication, so from the core team to the community. We're really lacking in bottoms-up communication from uh, the community to the core team. User research remains rare. Some DAOs admitted they didn't understand at all the profile of their own community members. Um, Data-driven analysis kind of exists, but it's mostly constrained to risk and financial analysis. So, we need to prioritize mechanisms to collect and incorporate contributor feedback 
and to use data to analyze DAO operations and decisions. Uh, this is the last category and it's my favorite. It was the most surprising to me when I was doing my research. Um, okay, concerns arise all the time in DAOs. No, I'm sure everybody here is no stranger to DAO drama, but how do we survive it? <laughs> and my takeaway was the difference between crisis and collapse was legitimacy. So the presence of conflict, whether it was created internally or externally, did not seem to be a distinguishing factor in which DAO succeeded and which failed. My hypothesis is the difference was legitimacy. Uh, Vitalik outlines this framework where legitimacy can be established in six ways by brute force, continuity, fairness, process, performance, and participation. Since DAOs are closer to sovereigns than corporations, that means their legitimacy is created endogenously, right, entirely within the DAO. So if that legitimacy is negated, there's no external mechanism to reinforce it and the DAO collapses. So if there's one takeaway from this presentation you remember, is that you need to do everything possible to avoid negating any of those six sources of legitimacy because it's an existential threat to your DAO if you do. So after all this research, how do we feel about DAOs? We feel good. Uh, DAOs are evolving at a rapid rate. Experimentation, iteration, and shared learning via initiatives like the Collective DAO Archives will only accelerate this. this these are now an open source public good. I use this every day to do my job. These are the things I've learned. I'm super excited to see what you do with them and what you learn. Um, so I'll, if you want to get further involved with the governance experiments and the governance research we're doing at the Optimism Collective, you can join by registering to be a delegate at vote.optimism.io. If you want to help maintain, update, correct, add to uh, these resources, you can just get in touch with me.